Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just really delighted, as always, to see such a nice crowd for this super cool topic. Uh, my name is Rebecca Cummings. I'm the Interim Director of Digital Matters, and I am so delighted to present our speaker for today. Dr. Lisa Swanstrom is an Associate Professor of English at the University of Utah and co-editor of Science Fiction Studies. Her vast and varied research interests include science fiction, natural history, media theory, and the digital humanities. Dr. Swanstrom's monograph, Animal, Vegetable, Digital, Experiments in New Media Aesthetics and Environmental Poetics was published by the University of Alabama Press in 2016. And her Digital Matters projects, such as the literary, or not Digital Matters yeah. projects, but I won't claim them, they're yours. <laughs> but the Literary Field Guide and Affects, um, Inventory of Affect are among Digital Matters favorites. Lisa's talk for today is the Digital Matters and Science Fiction. I will note, this is only our second talk that we're doing on the biz wall, so bear with us if we have any technical issues. But with that, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Lisa Swastrom. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. And it's really fantastic to be able to stack the crowd with students in my class. <laughs> so thank you for coming. And for those of you who are in other classes of mine, it's really nice to see you here. Um, I think that this talk will have a lot to do both with literature by the numbers and science fiction. So first of all, thanks Rebecca for inviting me. Thank you, Jack, for all of the logistics and TJ for helping out with the screen. I really appreciate it. So the first part of this, I'm gonna just read a kind of abstract and then it really will be an informal talk, an opinionated <laughs> talk about uh, data visualization and how science fiction might be able to help it, which begs the question that data visualization needs help, but perhaps we can all agree that it does. Um, so with that said, I'll just get going. The relationship between science fiction and digital culture is an intimate one, and perhaps it's a little too intimate um, in that it's difficult not to think of computational technology as somehow in cahoots with its various guises in popular culture. There are a lot of reasons for making this connection between the two. The uh, popularity, uh oh, our first glitch. <laughs> I can move this way. So there are a lot of reasons for making this kind of connection in popular culture between digital technology and science fiction. We have the Wachowski Brothers Matrix Trilogy, for example, um, which corresponds in terms of popularity with the rise of the NASDAQ and the plummet of the NASDAQ, which makes it hard not to see Neo's subsequent um, adventures and ultimate um, demise in the trilogy as somehow uh, corresponding to each other. Um, Mark Zuckerberg's meta draws uh, shameless uh, <laughs> um, inspiration from Neil Stevenson's in the Metaverse, which was imagined in Stevenson's novel Snow Crash, published in 1992. And long before virtual reality became the mass produced commodity it is today, um, William Gibson was writing about it in early form when he coined the term cyberspace in Burning Chrome, which was published in Omni in 1982. More recently, the story that I just handed out, the pieces of interest, uh, is called Born Under the Sign of Bonanza and imagines a center for memetics research in which scientists test the limits of viral information. And in a quote that reads eerily prescient, um, even though, of course, Dawkins coined the term means in the 70s, it wasn't until the 2000s, 2010, perhaps, it really became a household uh, word. Um, here is what they have to say in the story. Oh, we don't generate good ideas here at the you know, Center for Memetic Research. That would corrupt the experiment. The whole thesis of memetics is that ideas prosper on the basis of their ability to spread. It has nothing to do with whether they're true or false. To keep the experiment clean, we generate only bad ideas. And this has a lot, I think, to kind of say or suggest about contemporary disinformation. Um, the means of distribution, I would say, is no more efficient than with the mean as a kind of abstraction. If we go back even further literary history, the relationship between speculative fiction and digital technology becomes less intimate, perhaps, but also a lot more weird in that literary depictions of computation precede the invention of digital computers by nearly two centuries. We witness a fascinating precursor to natural language processing in 1726, for example, with the uh, word engine 
in Jonathan Swift's um, Boulder's Travels. And here we can see how the uh, Swift was satirizing the idea of a mechanized approach to um, linguistic creation, where he would have a bunch of his students line up at these levers, looks a little bit like a foosball table of words, and they would turn the levers and each of the blocks would form new combinations of words. Many times three or more words made sense, they would break them down and generate new prose without any or little bodily labor, uh, without the least assistance from genius or study. So a kind of mm -hmm. early approach to what we are now dealing with in terms of automated uh, text creation. And if we play loose with what we mean by natural language processing by Leading it with any kind of stochastic or algorithmic process that we apply to language, we can trace that genealogy back even further to antiquity with the oracles of Delphi and Jonah, for example, who, although are shrouded in mystery and religion, have nevertheless a very formulaic algorithmic approach to delivering prophecy that there is, in fact, a written, written record of. Okay. Correlation is not causation, however, and it's sketchy to claim that science fiction. Oh, sorry. In other words, computational reality and its representation in science fiction or proto science fiction are entwined to such an extent that the latter often appears to have a determining uh, influence upon the former. But correlation is not causation. And it's sketchy to claim science fiction wields predictive force. Nevertheless, because it does so often align itself with real world applications, SF provides an excellent means by which to gauge popular sentiment about computational processes. So in this talk, that's what I want to explore. I use selections from science fiction's vast archive to tease some things out. Rather than focusing on computation as a whole, however, I use it to think through one of the most important subfields in the digital humanities, which is data visualization. By considering how science fiction imagines the visual representation of information, and vice versa, how data visualization has tended to approach science fiction, I argue for a more playful approach to data explication that moves beyond the usual maps, bars, charts, graphs, and trees. Okay, so with that, now I want to get a little more chatty. Um, yes, data visualization, dictionary definition is the visual representation of information, right? That's how we understand it. It's a useful um, way to think about it, but it's also at heart a process of selection and abstraction. And what I mean by this is that it is so important to narrow down data in order to present results about that data. If you are dealing with thousands and thousands of points of information and you present a summary of that data in something that looks like this, which ironically is what PowerPoint shows to accompany the slide, um, you're going to lose your audience member unless your audience is a highly specialized and trained person. And that's fine for that context. But in terms of public facing data visualization, I really think we could be doing a more uh, coherent job in terms of data selection. So let me give you an example of very bad data visualization in terms of selection. This is a clip um, that comes from a show called Black Pattern. <laughs> I love the show. <laughs> so since my Black Adder goes forth, where he is punished by being a um, military uh, sergeant during World War I, and in the scene that you're about to see, the general is very excited because they have captured some territory. Now let's, of course I am. Now let's talk about something more jolly, shall we? Look, this is the amount of land we've recaptured since yesterday. Oh, excellent. Um, what is the actual scale of this map, darling? Uh, one to one, sir. <laughs> Come again. Uh, the map is actually life-size, sir. It's superbly detailed. Look, there's a little worm. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the actual amount of land retaken is? Excuse me, sir. 
17 square feet, sir. Excellent. So you see, young Blackadder didn't die horribly in vain after all. lost the sound. About the arguments that maps made, I would say that every, and I said this to y'all in class um, on Tuesday, every data visualization uh, makes an argument, right? Um, and in terms of maps, because it's part of our real world, those arguments have really, really high stakes. Sometimes, however, the data visualization is bad in the sense of just being ineffective. So take a look at this. I'm not sure at all how I'm supposed to read this. It has to do something with tracking commitments in terms of an election cycle. It's from data science, 365datascience.com. Um, the colors are too close together for me to differentiate really clearly. And in terms of the timeline, I'm really not sure how to read the fluctuating results. And I keep getting confused because the names are all over the place, right? So this is also an instance of very ineffective data visualization. This I would say, is also a problem with this one. <laughs> this is one. I hope this one's a joke. I think it has to be a joke because it doesn't even have a title. Um, but I've seen these in real world data visualizations, public facing data visualization. I doubt um, a doctor or a biologist would make something that wasn't labeled more precisely. But I've seen in popular culture countless instances of pie charts that are not jokes, <laughs> that are in fact divided up into tiny segments where you can't actually distinguish the colors and there's no way to determine what corresponds to what in terms of disparity length of teeth. So these I would say are bordering on the next problem in data visualization, which I would say is a problem of abstraction. What I mean by that is the form that you choose to take in terms of the visualization um, or expectation. Because you are abstracting no matter what. That's the whole point is selecting. So you don't have to throw thousands of data points at your audience. But you're also choosing which form, which abstraction to put that information inside. So those are those two good examples. But here I think <laughs> has another one, which I think gets a really bad rap. So the word cloud has been called the mullet of data visualization uh, since it's been kind of popular, um, you know, uh, emergence in the early 2000s. And while I agree that the word cloud can be a kind of simplified, reductive uh, way to present information, I actually think it's one of the most reader-friendly public-facing visualizations that's out there. At this point, whether we like it or not, we know how to read them. We understand that the larger the size means the more frequent the occurrence. Um, we don't need any more training than that. Um, although here, I don't know what the text is referring to, but I know just by looking at it, that Joe is really important for a first common to this text, right? But still, this has been criticized uh, quite frequently as a problem, and I would say it's a problem of the um, more abstraction. So what does all of this have to do with literature or science fiction? I would say actually it's an awful lot. Um, what science fiction in particular offers is the potential for extrapolation. This, in fact, is one of the definitions of science fiction, that it takes known information to kind of prognosticate or predict or extrapolates about future possibilities, right? And so what if we could have data visualizations that were a little more robust in terms of how and what they tried to communicate? And science fiction and literary studies and the arts offer a lot of good um, ideas for this. So a couple of examples just to get us warmed up. 
I love this example. <laughs> this is actually a very effective pie chart. Um, and in fact, this is just a slide, but if you go on the site, you can have a rollover and find out the exact number of how many deaths occurred. So stay away from knives if you are in Shakespearean play. And I am really intrigued by Mary to next starvation. I don't know which play that is, but I want to read more. And I would say this is a very effective data visualization um, just because of its clean, fun presentation. The stakes are not that high. Here, however, the stakes are extremely high. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was extremely important as a precursor for what we might now call informatics or data visualization, and not just for laughs, not just for giggles, but for doing beautiful, meticulously researched sociological visualizations that demonstrated what we are now grappling with in the form of systemic racism. By demonstrating, for example, how many people of color are in this profession or that profession or this profession by year, and managed to create these beautiful illustrations that are so clearly graspable um, in the process. Some of these works look as if they were made yesterday by an artist or by hand, and here they are in 1900 with the Paris Fair. Okay. So I also thought, well, hey, what if we looked at how <laughs> data scientists approach science fiction to see if maybe they have actually used some of science fiction or literary studies or art, the arts possibilities um, for making their assessments. And this is a beautiful essay by Stefania Perlini that appeared in the Jewish Humanities Quarterly about an archive in Canada called the Gibson Archive. Uh, Gibson was a collector of early science fiction books, but he not only collected them, he also then took them apart and recombined them in all sorts of idiosyncratic manners. It's just a fantastic archive, archive a fantastic project. And so what they attempted to do with their visualizations is demonstrate how the archive worked together, how it worked in relation to the original publication, and how it worked to science fiction in general. Now, with that said, it was a fantastic article. But if you were to ask me, Lisa, what does this mean on the screen? I would say, I will go read the article again <laughs> to be able to tell you that, because I can't tell you just from looking at it. And that's OK. That's not the purpose of this article. It's for a specialist field. We need to do some work. Um, but for public-facing stuff, I haven't quite seen um, the really kind of uh, charismatic, <laughs> um, easy to grasp uh, abstraction selection problem resolved. So is there a better way? Um, possibly, I'm not sure. But uh, data visualization in the arts offers some really interesting possibilities as well. We looked at this example in class. Does anyone remember what this was? Please. Yeah. It's a swan. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a painting by Homa of Clint. The swan is very, very much like an infographic, even though it's from the early 1900s, because we can abstract from a swan the color of its feathers, the darkness of its eye. Um, perhaps the setting or rising sun and the horizon or the blue sky or the blue lake upon which it swims, right? These are all kind of reaches, but they make some kind of sense. So here are some precursors to think of. I also think that this is one of the most powerful infographic precursors that we have in Western tradition. Um, even if you don't read Russian, and I do not, you could probably intuit that there is some conflict going on with this red triangle and this white circle. And you would be right. This is the Sotheby's um, <laughs> red wedge means white, which is highly symbolic, symbolic, extremely coded in terms of the Russian Revolution, where the red army defeats the Tsarist army with his fall for white army. So a really powerful um, uh, example from constructivist art uh, from uh, Soviet history. Science fiction and data visualization has me thinking that in terms of the examples I'm going to show you from science fiction, maybe visualization is not the word that we actually want to use. Because although vision is, of course, important, seeing things is, of course, the kind of primary means of sensing them, it's not the only way. And so what if instead we call it a kind of translation process? Rather than attempting to encapsulate in a kind of crystal clear visual form, whatever message it is we're trying to convey, we attempt a translation process through different sensory apparatuses and capacities. So, uh, for example, you might think of 
data translation into sound rather than into visual things or a combination of both. So here's the next clip. We don't need to play all of it, just the first few. How many of you have seen Close Encounters of the Third Mind? Six quavers, then pause. She sent us four quavers, a group of five quavers, a group. And it does by visual communication. Although you have in this clip, obviously, a pairing of the two lights flashing in correspondence to the music uh, that comes out. This is a fantastic mode of data visualization that is really underexplored. And I'll just say, because it's Spielberg film, <laughs> I remember in 19, I don't remember, remember, I've had vague memories of this machine, Simon Says, which was structured quite a lot like that uh, clip we just saw in terms of flashing color and sound, where you had to hit the color that made the sound. I can't tell you how many hours of my life I wasted <laughs> hitting that thing. And I think finally when it died, my parents threw away because it was so disruptive <laughs> and annoying. Um, the next instance I'll just mention, I'm not gonna show it because I did show this already in our class, but if you haven't seen it, this was an op-ed piece in the New York Times about how digital technology has changed both the way we listen to music as well as the music itself. And it has some stunning visualization of how uh, different parts of songs today are central in contrast to, I believe it's Aretha Franklin's Respect, for example, where you have a verse chorus alternation, and now they claim we have some visual photography, which I don't know what the technical term or not, but they do a great job of showing it and hearing it. If you see the combination, but it's, I find it very effective. The next thing I think science fiction can offer in terms of thinking through how to translate or explicate data is this concept of multidimensionality or holding space, right? Holding space, if you've ever read Dune or watched Dune, you might have heard of that term before. Actually talking about something much more simple. You want to recognize this from your childhood? Sure, yeah. It is! <laughs> so here, even if you um, don't really remember exactly the words, you probably remember this illustration from Madeline Langle's Wrinkle in Time from 1962, where the concept of traveling through space-time is illustrated by shortening the thread, by bringing the two ends of the thread together, demonstrating how you can move quickly through space. And we see this trope actually way before um, A Wrinkle in Time with Edmund Abbott's Flatland, a science fiction work, um, a romance of many dimensions told from the perspective of A dot square. <laughs> and what is so fascinating about this main character is that he literally is a square, which means a two-dimensional entity. So imagine you're a two-dimensional entity and you see something. First, you have to imagine that you're still able to see it in your own two dimensions. But if you see something coming at you, you see everything as a line. Everything is a single line. There's no depth. There's no fleshing out. And yet they still have terrible gender roles <laughs> and sex <laughs> in flat land, which is fascinating. But you see the same kind of visualization happening where the simple shape of a triangle squash down or propped back up, depending on the context of the story. Okay. And finally. <laughs> You see the super cheesy moment in Robert Zemeckis' contact where, oh, the aha moment, they find the primer for uh, building um, a uh, spacecraft that will allow them to travel through wormholes, and they do so by folding the information that's come to them from alien communication into uh, this shape here. I also wanted to mention that this kind of thing is not um, science fiction per se, but in, in the book art, the pushing 
against a traditional literary form is really cool and in alignment with science fiction. So Barjal the Bader's book, Snow White, from 1978, is a fantastic example of this. So here we have, it looks like a normal book, but when you open it up, it's a simple accordion book. There aren't any words in it, except for a very, um, very short key at the beginning. And the whole thing is a kind of exercise in folding and unfolding. So you can variously see sections of the text, one section of the text, or the entire text spread out in like a kind of endless accordion format. And it looks like this when it's opened up. Similarly, there's a tradition in science fiction of cryptograms, puzzle solving. And this is not necessarily appropriate to a kind of public facing, instantly graspable data visualization, but it is something that gives a lot of pleasure to at least some folks in terms of grasping information. So here are cryptograms from Jules Verne's uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth uh, in 1864, uh, Conan Doyle's The Adventure of the Dancing Men, 1903, and Edgar Allan Poe's The Bull Above, 1843, in between was right in this class. And I mentioned these together because um, Verne is kind of classically a science fiction adventure text, um, but both Poe and Doyle are detective stories, stories of radiocination, as we talked about. And so the crossover here is pretty fun to me. Um, and I just thought I would mention that in terms of this history, although not easily graspable. But, oh, and here's another example of this in science fiction. There are plenty to choose from. This one I like because it's more organic. This is a vegetable or botanical inspired alphabet in uh, Brewers of Problem and Communication. But we still take pleasure in puzzles. And so even if it's not easily accessible, we tend to think of them as sort of fun media for communication. Anyone recognize this or seen it before? So this is the kind of golden record that's meant to encapsulate um, Earth's culture and civilization sent on the Voyager mission in hopes of a, an alien life form being able to decipher what we're all about from this record. I don't know how effective it would be, uh, but we still like puzzles. I don't know if any of you followed this, but NASA, when it dropped or parachuted the rover onto Mars, encoded a puzzle into the parachute. And if you see how that parachute looks, um, it looks quite a bit like those pie charts from the earlier <laughs> slides. And in fact, it functions a little bit differently, but looks like it. It's actually binary code um, that they were able to solve by grouping it into um, Slices of 10, the red um, signified on and the white off, I believe. And then I'm not sure in the end how they finally decoded it, but it simply means, I believe, try brave things, do brave things, something like that. It's a literal translation of uh, binary things. We still love these challenges, um, even if you know they're not so accessible. To go back to the water Snow Way, this also is a play with encoding and decoding where we have this key. So when you read the book, you see that Blanche Neige or Snow White is the circle with the red center followed by a white center followed by a black center. And you see that the evil queen is the brown circle surrounded by a yellow circle. You see that the magic mirror is the yellow triangle. So on and so forth, the dwarves are these diamond shaped figures. And even if you didn't have that key, I would imagine that you might be able to intuit what is happening in this moment. Here is this giant ominous eyeball looking thing replicated <laughs> in a mirror-like surface. And to the left is a more vulnerable um, object, the circle of Snow White. And what you have here, what do you think? Exactly, it's the queen looking at herself, demanding a validation of her beauty being denied and Snow White about to be <laughs> ejected to the forest. <laughs> uh, and we can see other work by Marjorie the Water following suit. So here, for example, is um, Little Red Riding Hood, a very brief key where we have Little Red as the red circle, the forest is the green circle, um, and the wolf is the black circle. And here, we can probably intuit what was happening even if we did not have that key, right? Possibly. So I want to show you now 
a different kind of uh, uh, visualization of liberal red writing hood that is doing something completely different. And I'm not sure that I'm going to show all of it because I don't have plenty of time for this talk. Um, but this was a piece by uh, Thomas Wilson. You all saw a couple, like a minute of it, I think, class on Tuesday. And it is his version of Little Red Light. And this is also a video that I think it is embedded. We'll see. There should be sound there. different from your typical story of the Lord of the Rings. It's not to say that there aren't tons of adaptations that each other is telling, but I've never seen one that looked like an Ikea catalog. <laughs> and never again in Sweden, the big store is cost where you can buy anything and everything. Um, and to me, it looks like a cost and catalog where everything is on sale. Every aspect of the story is itemized and put in a catalog form, now only 399 euros. So what I would say is that back to that claim that I made that every data visualization makes an argument or has some kind of ethical stance behind it, I think this one is very effective, visually brilliant, and maybe a little ethically suspect, right? In terms of putting it just completely in a consumer context. But it worked for Nielsen. He got his first job, he won an award, and now he's you know, doing pretty well. But um, I think a brilliant data visualization that really made me think about what the form is doing and what it's capable of. Finally, in terms of science fiction, I'll just mention other ways to engage with data, and that is through tactile means, through touch, through haptics. So hand gloves, as we see in um, Spielberg's Minority Report, and we actually have this today as a controlling mechanism but not quite yet a popular means for communicating information. We also see it in the film The Sleep Dealer, which we're going to watch in our literature by the numbers class. 
where you don't see it here, but drone pilots, he's actually not flying, he's just somewhere else. But he is a drone pilot, and when he fires, his hand flexes and then returns in order to strike. Um, so really kind of fascinating, and this makes a really uh, bold critique of uh, remote warfare um, with this with this interface. And this recalls one of my favorite art installations um, called Intimate Transactions that <clears throat> I took part of when I was a graduate student at Santa Barbara. And basically what I did was sit in a chair that was a circular chair and look at a giant screen and it looks something like this. And I controlled an avatar with my back on the chair. I didn't use my hands at all, so very different from a normal you know, console or joystick. Uh, navigation. And instead, I used my back and shoulders to move around that chair, and I had an avatar that looked like half that. So it really was just a place for exploration. It had a beautiful soundtrack. It was filled with these creatures, computational creatures that looked like kind of magical microbes or something. But after a while, what happened is that there was an identical setup at UC Santa Cruz where another graduate student that I'd never met, had no idea who it was, was in the same chair, kind of chair. And that person too was controlling the other half of this avatar. And so our task was to join our avatars together and then navigate collectively in our chair. And joining together was no problem. That was really easy. We found each other and joined. And then navigating became a really fun challenge because where before you're just yourself, you know, moving your shoulders now, you're kind of pulling and pushing against someone else's movement. But you know what was so cool about it is that after about 20 seconds, we were in sync. Never met him, still know if a him or a her, right? And it was just one of the most fascinating projects in terms of haptic control or data visualization that I've ever experienced. I'd love to see more things like that. Okay. <laughs> This is not to say that science fiction is completely wonderful and innocent in terms of data visualization. In fact, I think we can blame it on a lot of atrocities. So here, for example, one of my favorite films, which is very problematic, is the Terminator T2, Judgment Day. Here we have the robot movie, <laughs> where we see the stats of everyone we encounter. Uh, one of my advisors in grad school, Alan Lewis, that he wanted that because he forgot names so easily. He just wanted to see, like, what's your name? What have you published? Where are you from? <laughs> and that would be actually quite useful. But in this case, it's used for, for murder, for surveillance, for violence. Um, also, uh, James Cameron's Avatar. Maybe it's not science fiction. Maybe it's just James Cameron. <laughs> but we have a kind of 3D map grid that is a uh, means for surveillance and control um, of the, the indigenous people of Angora. So those are some ideas that I've had, and I'm going to end by sharing with you just um, one example. If we have time, I'll show you, show you the other one of um, something that I think is really important. That is, okay, it's really easy for you to, so <laughs> to stand up here and bash on all these data visualizations. Um, what are you doing to make them better? Probably nothing, but I am trying. <laughs> and so what I'll say is after kind of slogging through all sorts of different things like Deku or Tableau, Python, um, I settled on something called Flask, which allows you to take Python scripts and put them online and make them accessible so people can use your Python script without having to uh, understand anything about Python or open up terminal or console. And so the first one I want to show you is inspired by um, it's called Kinetic Energies. It's online. It works. It's very simple. There's not much to it at all. And in fact, where it says that site is currently in development, it will probably say that forever. <laughs> so I'm just warning you. However, it was inspired by M.K. Jemison's trilogy of The Broken Earth, which is just a beautiful series of fantasy science fiction, I think it's both, that involves um, a very chaotic landscape full of um, kind of cataclysmic earthquakes. And the central kind of tension in the text is losing one's family in the face of all of this chaos. And when read against the backdrop of American slavery, um, the African diaspora, you can't help but think about how family relations have been just utterly destroyed um, as a part of that history. And yet when you think about fantasy novels in particular, the family tree is perhaps one of the most common data visualizations you will see 
and a work of fantasy. Here, for example, someone has done the hard work of trying to, to connect um, the uh, Targaryens to the Starks. But uh, the reason I show you this is because I don't have enough slides to show you how it appears in Game of Thrones. Um, it's in the appendix, 20 pages long in terms of family lineage. And it invariably relates to bloodright, aristocratic birthright, and um, nobility, right? So N.K. Jemison's work couldn't be farther from this. And so I wondered, how could you create um, a script that would allow you to just find out what the relations are among people who are in the story, rather than this history of ascendants and descendants. So um, I actually didn't do a video of it, but it is live, and if you wanted to um, check it out, you can. It basically is inspired by a lunar landscape. The moon is really important to this head. And it just gives you a breakdown of how many times mothers are mentioned, daughters, sons, fathers, brothers, extended family. It's a really simple type of um, but it's kind of fun you know, thinking family relations in a way that's not so linear. So I will show you this last one because I didn't make video of this. Um, this was something I made for um, a project um, in Paris that was sponsored by Germany. Uh, my German is terrible, but it's the Deutsche Forum for Kunstgeschichte, which means the kind of German Forum for Art and History or Art and History Research for Art. And their topic for the year that I was asked to participate was on new media. And I didn't know that I had anything. And then I thought about it. And I thought, yeah, maybe I do. <laughs> and so I wanted to develop this app for a while um, about John Ruskin, the kind of 19th century literary artistic critic who coined the term pathetic fallacy. Have you heard of this term before? Yeah. So he used the pathetic fallacy to indicate any time that you put pathos or emotion or intent or agency into non living or non living things. The pathetic fallacy. So I decided to kind of investigate that a little bit further because it seemed to me that Ruskin is a really sappy author <laughs> and that his books were filled with pathos and non living things experiencing emotion in one form or another. And this doesn't really have so much to do with science fiction, except science fiction is filled with this. So call it the not so pathetic fallacy. <laughs> and what it does is take um, any text and break it down in terms of emotion that is experienced that also has some kind of natural, uh, non human factor of building. And how did I do this? I could, <laughs> I'll show you if you want to see it. But it's a basically a kind of simple solution in Python where you take sets of breaks the thing into sentences, and then for every sentence that has a nature word, and I give it the vocabulary, it makes a list. And for every sentence that has an emotion word, it makes another list. And then you do a set of sentences that have both. Right? Really simple, straightforward. Um, and so the first thing that it does is tells us like a kind of sentiment analysis. And we learned the term of uh, uh, flexible diversity in class um, last week. So this tries to give you a sense of sentiment density, which is a similar ratio. Of all of the sentences in the text, how many have emotion? Uh, of all of the sentences in the text, how many have some kind of non-human thing experiencing or surrounded by emotion? And I did Jane Eyre with Dick and Ruskin's own modern papers. And then, and this is the cool part, and I have again to thank my, I am not a visual person, I do the code, <laughs> and my husband, my design partner, makes it look the way I want it to look. I, I have no talent on these lines, but I knew what I wanted. And what I wanted were pictures of emotional faces from the 18th century paired with Ruskin's own natural landscape that he painted. And so we were able to um, do that. I think this one's ready to go. It's not. So, and so what it will do is spit out a kind of analysis of all of the different sentences that have happy nature, Trees are happy, sky is happy, or there's some kind of happiness associated with it, et cetera. So that one, maybe you do need to press play. Okay, there's a no sound, that's okay. So here is uh, Jane Eyre. Reader, do you know, as I do, what terror those old people can put in the ice of their question, the avalanche of anger 
And here we have no pleasure, the silent trees. So we have these public domain images of emotional uh, states superimposed upon uh, landscape paintings that Ruskin did himself. So somber clouds um, and so on and so forth. And so in terms of making this happen, um, this is where I would, would be happy to tell you more about the coding behind it. But I would say that those images are much more interesting than diagramming points. That is all I have. <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to talk about anything that is heard. And if we don't have any in the room, Jack can check online and make sure. Where are we trying? I just have a direct question. Do we have an observation that I was in the first moment? Do you think that, um, what kind of Right now, about conceptual music, a lot of it involves the sonification of data. So, you know, like once you have patterns, and so there, there might be some things in the intellectual and useful end that generating endless music may be in quotes. Um, there's thing about the, the, the different aesthetic qualities. The visualization I have, and if you have thoughts on non materials, play in. I do. Yeah, in fact, those are the ones that are most used. So, the artist book that I, you know, the water I find fascinating, I could spend hours with those. Um, but I think for, what maybe happened with this is maybe just getting frustrated with the kind of production frequency analysis that you see in the digital humanities, where well, why did you do this? They said you can just go to Voyant, which you all have used. You can get your free word cloud or free bar graph or your free whatever. And I would say, because those are soulless <laughs> and they're very useful, and I think they are like, very well designed. But in terms of criticism as an active creative process, which I hope everyone um, you know tries to make it, I think that there's so much more possibility. And so for me, it's not so much the infographic that you would see for, you know, idea or for a political summary, but just how the aesthetics kind of reach over into the sort of all um, thought process. So important. That could be a long process. <laughs> Um, so something that I was really interested in was when we were talking about encoding and decoding, because I think so often when people are talking about visual design, they're thinking about like frictionless design, like they want it to be as easy as yes. possible for the information yes. and you know, to be competent in all Yes. And so I'm curious what examples you can think of of data or audiences where you feel like puzzle or encoding and decoding data to actually make that data more accessible. Right. Well, that's such a great question. So um, I have a couple of answers. One is not so much visualization per se, but gamification. So there is a search engine that's still around. It's called Ecosia. And it's a I search don't know. Dude, I use it too, and it's great. So basically, Ecosia, if you haven't heard of it, is a search engine that donates um, all of its profits. Uh, it, it uses money to pay for overhead costs, but all of its process, uh, profits go to um, uh, natural conservation, right? Especially the last time I checked um, in Brazil um, in terms of endangered and hidden forest areas. Now, I'll be the first to say that while that sounds amazing, it's also really problematic politically. They don't really have dialogue with the people <laughs> who live in that area. So much as they are interested in conserving the kind of concept of nature, that's a little bit dicey. But the gamification in the early stages of the code was super interesting along the lines that you bring up because it would give you some stats where every time you used it, it could say, you have saved X amount of rainforest, and at that time it was just going to be better. <laughs> so you get this kind of like pat on the back. Um, and then they kind of fessed up and said, these are just statistical averages, they're kind of meaningless. 
And so instead now we just kind of feel much by like using it, which I do. But, <laughs> but that would be an instance where the kind of problem solving or gameplay or participatory nature um, could be very exciting. And I think there's a lot of room for that. Another instance I would say of creative visualizations about environmental danger, preparing, global warming, climate change, et cetera. And Heather Hauser, who was here a few years ago, um, has written a really wonderful book just on data visualizations that relate to environmental concerns about how they operate, what their tactics are, how accurate they actually can be. Um, how rhetorically so often they are designed to instill a kind of panic or fear, um, and how we should interpret those visualizations. And so I would say that her work would be really interesting for me to look at in terms of that kind of line between instant accessibility, frictionless, instantaneous um, understanding, and depth. Of analysis, which is so necessary in these conversations, but which means data visualization often fails. So it's a great question. Yeah, well, I know challenges some people have in using the post 1923 literature for digital media yeah. and project with copyright. Yeah. I'm thinking about BYU and their mid course. Of course. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, literature into history and this is data, yeah. do you find that transformative? Is it not something you worry about with copyright? Or I guess the broader question is what copyright challenges are you well, I'm being about to say, like, well, I'll be in jail together. Experience is real. And I think that when I um, use texts to um, you know, run a play on Twitter, no one's reading that except my play on Twitter. So I'm not too concerned about it. I will say that the data rights management issues have become a lot harder <laughs> to get around. I used to be able in five minutes to have um, something that I bought from Amazon and be able to get um, I can't really do that anymore. So I've been resorting to really dodgy libraries that um, I do on my own computer on my own time um, that have great results, but I always feel a little sketchy. Um, because if I could, Get it from a Kindle or an ebook, I would, but I'm no longer able to strip it and read it. Yeah, so I don't know, but it does force me to kind of work in public. Yeah, I mean, okay. No, I think we'll share it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Before you all head out, I do have just a couple really quick announcements. Our next event that we're having in Digital Matters is on, is it the 21st? The 21st at one o'clock, Lori Larson will be teaching on data crafting using Adobe Illustrator and visual research methods. We are capping that at 10 participants. So if you wanna participate, please do sign up as early as you can. The other thing I'll say is that we have our annual Digital Humanities Symposium coming up, DHU 7, down in Cedar City. If you haven't yet registered, registration is still open. And lastly, if you're not on our Digital Matters list server and you'd like to be, the sign up sheet is right over there. So thanks everyone for coming. Hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs>